I used three guitars mainly for the rhythms and the clean tones. One was the, this one. It, it was actually the prototype that I used on the record. Um, I used a 76 Les Paul Custom, which I've been using for years. Um, and the clean tones, all the clean tones were done on a, it was a, again, a black and white uh, Telecaster that I bought in Amsterdam. There was a, there's a, I don't know if you've seen, there's a pedal called the Miku pedal, and it does this weird kind of wacky Japanese voicing, and it's, it, it's unusable for anything else, but it makes everyone laugh and smile, so I bought it. And I was trying it in the shop, and I needed a guitar to, to try it with. And I thought the Telecaster looked quite sexy, so I picked up the Telecaster, and it was, so I, I bought both, you know, I've got the Telecaster. So it was on a, just a, on a whim, really, I bought this Tele. And uh, a few years later, we were in the studio recording Firepower, and um, we are looking for a guitar. We had a great clean tone with a Strat, and we used the, the Les Paul, we used this. We were looking for that tone, and I had this Telecaster there, and we picked it up, and we put it through the, the Yamaha JC120, which is famous for having that stereo chorusing image, uh, sound, you know. And nothing, nothing beat the Tele. It was just a pristine clean, full-bodied clean tone, and we used it for all the, all my clean parts anyway on the record. But everything else was done on the prototype V and uh, a Les Paul. And then, I came, like any lead parts, I, I used a, an old 79 V, I used uh, some old custom guitars, I used uh, a, um, a 54 Gold Top, I used a 63 Strat, I used a 61 Strat, just to get, because in my mind, that's where these guitars should be. A lot of people, they buy them, they put them in a, in a vault or a, you know, in a safe somewhere, and they never get heard. So in my mind, this, that's where these guitars need to be. They need to be on recordings. They need to, they, we need to experience these guitars, either live or on a record. So I tried to get as many different guitars on as I could for the lead parts and the embellishments and stuff like that, really. So uh, it was incredible. It was fun, really. And hearing the different voices of all these guitars from different years, and you could have two guitars in the, from the same year, and they sound vastly different, you know. But some of them have that character that's just a bit unique that adds something to the song. From my point of view, uh, between the two records, there was definitely more thought on this one as to what I'm going to say on this one. You know, the first record, I'm there, I'm happy to be there, I'm fortunate to be there, I'm writing with these masters, and I'm learning what I can, and putting down what I can, um, and I'm kind of just happy to be there, and, you know, involved in it. This one was a bit more of a, if uh, importance is the right word, this is a bit more important. What's my voice going to be now? This is the second record. What am I going to say on the, on the guitar? If someone puts on this CD or this, this album, how are they going to tell that it's me speaking through the guitar? So there was more of a conscious effort with that. And it was more of a pulling back in terms of speed and, um, and being flashy, more of an emphasis on melody and note choice and phrasing uh, and just trying to create my own unique fingerprint with those melodies, you know. And I think that fingerprint shines through. The, the more notes there are, the less space you have for that fingerprint to shine through. And all these guys we, we spoke about before, Michael Schenker, Zach Wilde, Randy Rhodes, they were incredible technicians, but they had space and phrasing which allowed that fingerprint to, to shine through. And you can tell it's them, you know. David Gilmore is another one, Brian May is another one, Jimi Hendrix, you know, they've all got uh, that, that musical fingerprint. Uh, so it was, I was trying to find my own one. And it, there's millions of players that are in there, you know, in my brain, and I can hear Schenker, I can hear Zach, I can hear, you know, different parts of everyone. And hopefully it comes out in your own, in your own way, you know. So that's, that's what I was striving to achieve on this record, definitely. I had a friend of mine that was playing drums for Sir Christopher, and I don't know how, I don't know how that happened, but uh, he called me and he said, this was for the first record, and he called me and he said, uh, I'm working with Sir Christopher Lee. I'm like, what? Like, you know, doing heavy metal, and that's what's happening. Can you come and play guitars? And I think I was out on the road at the time, uh, and I, I couldn't do it. I had to say, no, I'm not able to do it. So the, the second album came around, and it was called, uh, I think it was called Charlemagne, The Omens of Death. And it, it, apparently it, it turns out that Christopher Lee is a descendant of King Charlemagne. 
So there's a connection to the story, and he's kind of singing, narrating, and there's different characters in the story. And uh, they approached me again uh, to not only play, but they asked me if I could arrange uh, the, the music for it. So they had some ideas, they had some general, uh, and it was kind of symphonic, um, orchestra, orchestra based. And they wanted it to be arranged for a, a heavy metal band to play, you know. So the, the ideas of the songs were there, but, you know, I could take stuff from that and create metal songs out of them. And uh, I was available at the time. And uh, I said, yeah, absolutely, you can't turn that down. And uh, it was quite an experience. And obviously I met Sir Christopher, and he was a character, you know. He's, he's seen many things and he's experienced different things. So it's great to, uh, you know, talk and experience someone like that, um, that has so much experience. You get different viewpoints, you get, you know what I mean, all that sort of stuff. He's a, he was a character. And, um, you know, sadly he's no longer with us, but, I mean, he's, he's films and his music, he's gonna, he's gonna live on forever. And everything he's been through, and he's making heavy metal at 92, that's just such a, it's such a great thing, it's such an inspiration for anyone, you know. If anyone's feeling like, ah, oh, I'm too tired to do it today, or I don't think I can, you know, for whatever reason, that dude's doing it at 92, so you haven't got an excuse anymore, you know. So, it's an incredible inspiration on that's many levels. Man. was the man with the golden gun. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. He was a hero, man. Yes. <laughs> And in, in reality as well, I think he, he served in the war, you know, so he was a hero on many levels, so absolutely.